The following program is a Town of Colony television production of the William K. Sanford Town Library. It goes all my life a circle, sunrise and sundown. The moon rolls through the night time till the daybreak comes around. And all my life's a circle, but I can't tell you why. Seasons spinning round again, the years keep rolling by. Happy holidays. I'm Joe Doolittle. And I'm Kate Dudding. And this is Story by Story. Celebrating the human spirit. And we're storytellers. And we're all about storytelling and kind of learning more about the way stories get told in our lives mm -hmm. and we love to listen to stories and uh, Kate and I are both producing storytelling programs here and there so we like to kind of organize stories and we're here to spend some time with you uh, sharing the idea of stories now I always ask you this question <laughs> I'm always impressed What's the most interesting thing you've been doing lately? Well, in preparation for being the professor of defense against the dark arts at Harry Potter Day at the Schenectady County Library just before Halloween, I worked up the story, the folk tale, Kate Crackernuts. Kate Crackernuts. Mm. And there's a prince, well, Kate Crackernut's um, stepsister has had her head changed into a sheep's head. Kate's mother was a little jealous of how pretty, Kate, she, was. pretty she was. So Kate and she left before the mother did something else and are off to try to find out uh, a cure for this. And in the meantime, they come across a kingdom where the prince is sleeps all day, and it's just getting weaker and weaker. And Kate uh, says that she will sit with him and hoping to get the bushel of gold. Ah. So I practiced this up at the open mic at Saratoga, uh -huh. and the people there were so responsive. I put in participation because uh -huh. this was going to be like a 10-year-old audience at the library. So at the last stroke of midnight, bong, and they, they picked right they up picked on right that. Uh, the prince got bong. up, walked to the stable, got on a horse, the Kate jumped behind him, and off they went. <laughs> Very. <laughs> Very. <laughs> and then uh, they, they, they got to a, oh, they passed the nut grove and they, they, she had picked nuts and put them in her pockets. An important plot point later okay. on. And they got to a green hill, an open green hill and let the prince in. Prince and his horse in. And the lady behind him too. And a doors appeared, squeak, and in they went, mm -hmm. squeak. They, they, they are actually a little more responsive than the kids. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, your squeak so. was pretty good, but your it's not going to it's not going to ever match the horse. That's oh, the, the horse, oh, the, the, the riding horse. Yeah. It's you, you, your, 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 your slice down. Yes. Well, so it's a little harder when you're standing up. And it, and it went really well. <laughs> yes. Yes. In both places, it went very well. Well, I can't top that one. I just, I, I can't, I can't even do that. So, yeah. <laughs> uh, but I, I have decided. But you can sing better than I do. So. I, well, occasionally I do. Occasionally I do. But uh, I've got a, a, a program I have to do with, for a fellowship breakfast at church, and uh, you know how you're going through the files of all the things that yeah. you tell. Kind of thing? And there's one there, and it's the master of the calculated risk. And that's Jimmy, General Jimmy Doolittle, okay. my distant cousin who took bombers off of the, mm -hmm. the carrier Wasp and bombed Tokyo in April of 1942, soon after Pearl Harbor. And it was a, it was a risky thing to do. Some people thought it was a suicide mission, but he was such a, a, a wound tight engineer mm -hmm. that he'd figured out a lot of stuff like where they were going to ditch their planes when they ran out of gas in China and things. And all but eight fl 
flyers made it back and two were back after the war because they were in POW camps the whole time. Uh, but only six actually died in the raid. And uh, that's the whole story in a mm -hmm. way of what happens to them when they get back. But um, So that's going to be my my fellowship program. And it, and it jumped out of me off of the file saying, oh, that story, I remember that. <laughs> And it was, oh, and the breakfast is on December 7th. Okay. It's Pearl Harbor Day, and even though he wasn't at Pearl Harbor. Right. You know. It was the predecessor. So, so our, our stories are, are, are with us. Uh, one of the nice things about a, a story is that they tend to stay with you, uh, and they come back and greet you, so that now that you've reestablished the story with the princess and the... Well, this was actually my first time through Kate Cracker Nuts. Mean, I mean, I knew the story. I had read the story, too. But you never told the story. I had never told the story. Wow. And I did kind of cut out the, the beginning of the... It took her three times for the sheep's head to... Uh, but, you know, that I went right to the meat of it. Uh, where so I stand corrected. Sometimes when you're looking for inspiration, you find the right story to tell, <laughs> and it can it can involve baskets of gold. It's really you know. yes. and you don't have to, your heroine doesn't have to have the same first name that you do. But oh, that, I, I, that was an, an, another thing that um, I liked. <laughs> well, one of the things we like to do with our time with you guys as the viewers is to kind of introduce you to other regional storytellers, people who are doing interesting things with the, with the world of story, uh, with word and sometimes with song. Um, and we have a really special person here who's doing a lot of interesting things. Um, Eileen Mack is with us. And Eileen Mack uh, has been a storyteller about 10, 15 years. Well, I joined the Guild when I um, moved to the area, so yeah. I don't know how many years ago that was, but, you know, in teaching and speech therapy and nursery school and, you know, storytelling, you know, it's just there. It's part just of the, what you It's kind of what you do. do. Yeah. yeah. Well, you, you've been doing it for... Now, and professionally, you, you were a teacher and you were a s speech therapist. And, but you grew up around here, didn't you? I grew up in Ballston Lake, New York. Ballston Lake, home of Carney's Tavern. That's right. And that actually used to belong to my grandfather. Is that right? It was the Ballston Lake Hotel. And my father was the youngest of seven children, and all his older siblings were born in that hotel. Really? But he, when he was born, uh, his mother and his eldest sister, Mary, who was like 17 at the time, got on the trolley, which was right next to their train tracks in Boston yeah, Lake, yeah. took the trolley down to Schenectady, walked up the hill to the hospital, and that's where my father was born. <laughs> oh. You know, I so, yeah. sometimes you just don't know when to expect a good story. Right? <laughs> oh, um... I was in labor, and my husband drew, drove over the Rexford Bridge faster than he has ever done before or since. It was after midnight, so there really wasn't any traffic. And I was dropped off at the door, hopping a trolley and then walking up a hill. Huh. <laughs> yes, for your seventh child. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Wow. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm the I'm the fifth child, and I was. I was born in the front seat of a 38 Plymouth, uh, <laughs> four seat. blocks shy of Samaritan Hospital in Troy. Wow. And, you know, and you've never told me that before. I'm sorry. It's one of the. It's one of my great stories. And and when Fran, have you, you heard where Fran Yardley was born? She was born in a Woody. In a Woody. Yes. Like oh, that, oh I I can't say I was born in a Woody. I, right. A station wagon station with wood, wood panels. panels. Oh, yes. Ford Woody. Yep. Yes. Again. Those were beautiful. Yeah. Uh, not. Not the best place I to have. On the way to the hospital. I didn't know I had that in, in common yes. with Janine. We were both no, we, in the cars. Fran. Fran Yarlow. Fran Yarlow. Fran Yarlow. Oh. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know anything about Janine Lavery's oh, birth. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but I guess we could do a whole program on <laughs> well, childbirth stories. <laughs> well, it goes it goes back to, to kind of the, the setting of growing up because, you know, Balsa Lake is a charming little village, and you know that must have been a fun place to kind of start out in terms of doing stuff. Well, well it was like I mean, we were talking about Halloween, and Halloween, you know, we often made our own costumes, or once in a while I'd get one of the ones in those awful boxes, you know, <laughs> and then off you'd go out the door, up and through the Buell, and down through the village, and. Uh, 
We'd always go to Muriel Ketchum's house. Muriel, you're listening? And we thought for sure, every, every year we'd think for sure she wouldn't be able to recognize <laughs> four little girls, you know, but of course she always knew who we were. And then we'd go to the firehouse because they always had a Halloween party that's right, that's right. and you'd have a parade and they'd serve cider and donuts. And it was about once a year that you would get that cider and donuts. Mm -hmm. you know? So it was special. But I wish I knew more about when my dad was growing up there because it really, that would be a great story. Mm -hmm. Because he had the run of the village yeah. and it was before the roads were paved. They used to take their sleds up by what's now called Stevens Elementary School. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And they would start sledding down there, come down Lake Hill, and make the right oh, go down Main Street. Yeah. yeah, wow. That's a good run. Yeah. And uh, he'd go swimming in Boston Lake. He'd go yeah. swimming in Kimball's Pond. All his sisters, um, I think all of his sisters, maybe not Mary, swam the length of the lake. Dad was in the water swimming, and somebody was in, you know, a canoe yeah. going along with him. But they swam the lake. He, the lake. he got he got out. <laughs> but his dog Shep was running along shore, uh, keeping track of him. You got some stories there, some stories yeah. there. Well, yeah, and there's an arm. You know, this week was Armistice Day, and when um, Armistice Day happened, he was about four years old, mm -hmm. and. I, you know, it takes a little while for the news to get from Europe over to here and whatever, but by the time it got to Boston Lake, I mean, everybody was cheering, and the kids were out in the street, and they grabbed my dad, put him in the front of a coal scuttle, gave him a little, I think a white flag to wave, probably a stick with a rag on it, and they went up and down the streets, the street of Main Street, you know, yelling and hooting and hollering, and my dad was at the head of the parade with all the kids following. There you go. It's just know. the right age to fit in that coal scuttle. <laughs> Get moved along. See, I was I was just connecting with Carney's Tavern. <laughs> <laughs> well, and Carney's Tavern itself has a great history because the McDonough's owned it when I was a kid, and and mm. then uh, Rosemary and Bob, Bob Carney yeah. owned it, and was and great story about their bartender Danny Ward, who was like a legend. When Danny died, way too young. But he had lots. He too was completely devoted to Boston Lake. He was like my dad. You didn't need to go anywhere else because you had Boston Lake. And uh, they 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 still honor Danny. Uh, they it was a picnic. Have, yeah, a, a yeah. run every run, year in yeah. his name, and the scoreboard at the high school oh. is in his name. So yeah, it's car Boston Lake Hotel, oh. McDonough's, Carney's Tavern, and now a, a very nice young couple is running right. it, and it's so good to have. And a place to go and have community and have good right. food. Mm -hmm. so, mm -hmm. Thanks, Carnies. <laughs> yep, yep, yep. Um, one of the things that it, it, our listeners might be interested in is you've, in addition to telling a variety of stories, but you've developed a real art in kind of the, I want to say, kind of famous women and, and kind of being able to do a, a one-woman show about interesting people, and it's been with her sing, songs with, involved. With songs involved too. It's right. I, I, I remember the first time I heard you do the Jeannie uh, Robert Froster, that I didn't expect you to start singing, <laughs> and you kind of and you were behind me, and I was in the back of the presentation area at the Irish Museum, and you started to sing, and I, I thought the angels were right with us. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know. When you don't play an instrument well enough to accompany yourself, because when you try to do that, it's like shooting yourself in the foot. You have to, you know, just say, well, you know, we'll um, do, it. do it a cappella. You know, you do the, you know, I've sung the national anthem many times. I even sang it for Hillary Clinton once, yeah. out in Altona, New York. Who ever heard of Altona, New York? But it's a little tiny village northeast of Plattsburgh. But it was the only place that could hold 750 people. <laughs> This was when she was our state senator. So anyway, yeah, you kind of learn to just do it a cappella. And I wish I had more women that I've done, but I've, mm -hmm. I've just not been ambitious enough. So I have Jean Robert Foster, who, whom I love, and I love her stories. And the fact that she grew up in, in the Adirondacks. Mm -hmm. um, so for some reason, I wanted to tell stories at the Saratoga National Battlefield, you know, mm -hmm. the historic mm -hmm. battlefield. 
Oh, because I had a friend who was working there as a as a park docent or something. Yes, yeah. and that was you couldn't just go and tell stories there. You you had to have it somehow relate. Mm -hmm. So I started looking into Catherine Schuyler, but I couldn't find much on Catherine mm -hmm. Schuyler. So then I began looking into Elizabeth. Schuyler. And Catherine Hamilton. was Catherine, Catherine Schuyler. Was oh, she was married mother. to Philip Schuyler. Philip Schuyler. She, so was she, was, she was a Van Rensselaer. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. An heiress. Yes, an heiress for sure. Mm -hmm. So um, so I started looking into Elizabeth, and I remember, I can't remember what year, but you, the uh, story circle of the Capital Districts, maybe you can, the Capital District, produces something called word plays. Mm -hmm. Right, right. I remember, and that was when we were upstairs in the Fenimore room. Because I remember, for some Rocky. reason, I remember seeing you. I can see you, and then the glass overlooking the atrium below. Right. So I tested out part of the story of Elizabeth Schuyler Hamblin, which I call the naming ceremony. When she was about 12 years old, she got adopted by the people of the Longhouse as a way to further connect. Mm -hmm. um, the League of Six Nations with with the uh, with, with, with the, the English, English and yeah. with uh, the family of Philip Schuyler because he for a long time had a good, good relationship had created a good relationship with um, the native peoples from his trading days and that served well you know for the military conflicts too so then it was like well then what do I do with it well I think I wrote a probably many many pages. And it was too long to put into one show that anybody would want to sit through. It would have to have an intermission and people with, you know, ears of iron to listen to the same voice for like, mm -hmm. two things. So I ended up, because time was a, 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 I ended up just creating the program. Maybe someday I'll do the second part. I wanted to do about her life after Hamilton died, because mm -hmm. he died in 1804, and she died in 1854. Whoa. So she <laughs> lived another 50 years. And while we're pretty sure that we know she missed him and loved him, mm -hmm. despite everything and because of everything, uh, but she went on and had her own life. And so I kind of really wanted people to know that. Mm -hmm. But I ended up, just the way I've been doing the program, is just pretty much talking about her early years, starting with that naming ceremony, mm -hmm. and then talking about the people that came to visit, and then it ventured to the Coes Falls, mm -hmm. and um, up until she, you know, meets Hamilton and they get married. So, and this is a, a one-woman show that you do in concert with the uh, musicians of Malwick. So there is there is music in this that's not a cappella. Right, well, when I do it with them, when I've done it before on my own, and oh. it's a little different, but when I was looking for music to do, I went to Anne Marie Barker Schwartz. I had met her in a bar class. It's like an exercise class. Oh, well. <laughs> I thought we were back in Kari's again. I'm sorry. Yeah. 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 We'll be right up again. I think. <laughs> so, and then I bumped into her one time when she was out. She's also a, a ballroom dancer, and she and her husband Fred were doing a showcase at a cotillion dance event. And so I went up to say hi to her because I hadn't seen her since our fitness class. And so when I was looking for music, to go with this from the late 1700s, early 1800s, I went and I asked to meet with her. Mm -hmm. And she got interested in the project, and this was a long time ago, but she said, well, maybe someday we can do it with the musicians of Malwick. And she, Anne Marie apparently, I mean, if you look at the schedule of, of events that the musicians of Malwick mm -hmm. um, is doing, no, there are no two things that are ever the same. Right. I mean, they just did a ghost story Thing, program. Yeah. Uh, um, if Anne Marie gets an idea, she not only has the imagination to go with it, but the the, the how to make mm -hmm. it happen. Mm -hmm. So, um, yes, I've been able to been working with Anne Marie Barker Schwartz, Norman Thibodeau, and uh, Stan Isaacson, mm -hmm. and and when I sing, I'm not just singing like. You know, 
folk song. Now I'm singing Handel's Where Air You Walk, mm. and a song by the first American composer, Francis Hopkinson. You oh, may have really? heard of William Billings. He did a lot of early choral music, so yeah. he's considered the first choral music mm -hmm. a composer. But Francis Hopkinson wrote songs that people just sang. Mm -hmm. So Anne Marie suggested this song, and it's perfect. It's called uh, My Love Is Gone to Sea. Oh. So, anyway, so I get to sing with a violin, a classical guitar, and a flute. <laughs> and I'm very impressed. No piano yeah, or bass. <laughs> that's a bass. You know, I, you were at the, the mansion, and then you were... You, that's the Schuyler mansion, Schuyler mansion in Albany. In Albany. <laughs> and then you were recently, because I couldn't get there, you were at SCC? We did it at Schenectady County we, Community College, college because... Um, they teach, they teach there. Yeah, they, yeah. But I had a friend come down from North Creek, North Creek, Evelyn Green. She's seen the Gene Robert Foster show, and her father was Paul Schaefer, the conservationist. Right, and right. The home builder. And um, so she's seen the Gene Robert Foster show many times, but she, she came all the way down for that. So that was that was very nice. You know, some, it's great to tell the stories and sing the songs, but when you go out and do these, events sometimes the best part is like seeing who comes and they getting right. to talk with people afterward mm -hmm. and it's that's a, a lovely part of it mm -hmm. I, I think I went to high school with her sister I think it's like no, I should bring that up that's another whole story okay. yeah <laughs> See, so many no things are connected <laughs> right. do you have a story do you want to tell us um, do you want to do a part of Elizabeth, what you, would you well, like to do? I, what I thought today was um, I come across an, two, two ideas. One is the idea of awe. And I thought I might toss that out and see what your thoughts are about awe and experiencing it because not that my stories are going to fill you with awe, but just somebody was saying the other day, well, if you can't name the emotion, you can't have that emotion. And I think that we really just haven't quite sorted out, like the love, you know, like shale. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like there are so many layers, and maybe there are some things and emotions that we just really haven't quite pinpointed. But the, the one about awe, because I, I read this article about it, I don't know, when I saved the article and I came across it when I was getting ready to come today. And awe, the, the opportunity to have awe is so good for us mm -hmm. that it's an, oops, sorry, it's an emotion that helps our brain and helps our, our being. Mm -hmm. So I don't know, have you had any awesome experiences lately? Well, it's, uh, there's a segue to my friend Harlan Ratmeyer, who's the chaplain at Albany Med. Um, he gets uh, three or four shots at medical students. And one of the first things he does is he talks with them about awe. And he asks them to describe some time when they've been awed by something and what it was. And then he reverses it and says that patients and staff will begin to regard them with awe because they're physicians. And that recognizing awe and being able to kind of reciprocate an emotion that leaves your ability to be the doctor but also gives you the opportunity to be the caregiver and it's focused on awe and also acquiring some humility and it's the juxtaposition of those two things and uh, I can't do it the way he does that workshop but it's the kind of thing that those young professionals remember. And I think that's important part of it. Oh, so even though people treat you like you can walk on water, you must keep in mind <laughs> that you really can't. And, and, and it's, that's right. And it's best for their care that right. you remember that. Right. And, it, and that you must appear to be that you're walking on water. Mm -hmm. you know, I mean, that, mm -hmm. that, that there's a sense of confidence about that. Right. But it's in, it's in this whole dynamic of, of being able to uh, experience awe and realize that in a way you might be the source of it for people. Mm -hmm. um, and I've never had that problem with myself, but being the source of awe for other people. But I think you probably underestimate that, don't well, you think so, Kate? Okay. 
Well, and you too, with your storytelling. It can be awe-inspiring, it really. It was, I think sacred stories fall into that, and it's not necessarily, by sacred stories, I don't necessarily mean it about any particular religion, mm -hmm. but it's a story that you want to say amen to, meaning, yes, this is the way it should always be, yes, this is right, this is true. Uh, but when you said all, what first came to mind was I saw two pictures, two photographs juxtaposed um, some Facebook friend. Actually, several have sent them. And one was a, 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 a photograph of a Gothic cathedral, and the columns were bathed in either dawn or sunset light, that golden light that comes at the beginning at the end of the days. And then right next to it was displayed a grove of trees with, with a path through it, not, not a road, but a path through it. And they looked remarkably similar, mm -hmm. again, with that same golden light. And that reminded me of Peggy Ayer's song about we learn to dance from the movement of trees. Mm -hmm. and that those trees perhaps inspired the architects of the Gothic cathedrals. Huh. Right, so, so when I, it was like, the, the, the side of them, I, you know, I, even though it, was, it wasn't very big on my screen, was... You got it. I got yeah. it. Well, you think about it, that people probably were out in the cathedral of trees. Mm -hmm holding sacred ceremonies or giving thanks or whatever. Mm -hmm. So just man imitating nature. Mm -hmm. Well, one of the times that I, I felt, realized I was feeling awe was when I was at the Cliffs of Moher in Ireland. Mm -hmm. I heard of the Cliffs of Moher. Big deal. You know, you've probably seen pictures on TV or in a magazine or something. But when I got there, it, it was amazing because the wind is coming fully across the Atlantic Ocean. It's blowing you. You have to like walk bent over and the waves are crashing and the surf's coming up creating rainbows along the edge of the cliffs and the birds are swirling in and out of the, the crashing waves and I felt awe. Mm -hmm. So I was trying to figure out how awe was going to, I was going to, um, get that to link with what my stories are, but <laughs> I think I just figured it out. <laughs> because talking about the Cliffs of Moher, it was the the wind was a huge mm -hmm. part of that experience. So today I have a, several stories that involve the wind. Mm -hmm. So not just hot air, but wind. <laughs> so go. Go. Right. Okay. So you may have heard this story before, especially if you have children or grandchildren in, um, in a preschool program or early elementary school, because it's one that you're likely to find there. One day, a little boy had gone through his puzzles, was tired of building with his blocks, and was driving his mother crazy, asking her, what can I do, what can I do? And finally, he wore the mother down. She sighed. She said, all right, I have a task for you. You need to go and find a little red house with no doors, no windows, a chimney, and a star inside. Oh, Mom, where am I going to find anything like that? She said, you are telling me how bored you are. You've done everything that you wanted to do in this house, and unless you want to start helping with the dishes and sweep the floor, you need to go find that little red house with no doors, no windows, a chimney, and a star inside. Okay, so off he went down the road, not knowing really what to expect. It was a kind of a breezy day, and he's kicking the dirt under his feet as he goes along, and he came to his neighbor, a little girl. He thought, well, maybe she would know. So he asked his little friend, Hi, and she greeted him back. Hi, I'm looking for something. Well, what are you looking for? Maybe I've got it. Well, his eyes 
you knew yours perked up at that. Maybe she did. I'm looking for a little red house with no doors, no windows, a chimney, and a star inside. Hmm. The little girl thought. She looked around her yard. She thought it was in her toy chest. Hmm. I don't have anything like that, she said. Sorry. Well, that's okay. Thanks for thinking about it. And off he went down the road, taking a stick, dragging it in the sand as he went along, till he came to the farmer. Now, farmers know a lot. They work seven days a week. They're looking out in the world at what's going on all the time. Maybe this farmer would know. So he went up to the farmer and he said, Good morning, farmer. Good morning, boy. How are you doing today? I'm trying to find something. But what are you trying to find? I'm trying to find a little red house with no doors, no windows, a chimney, and a star inside. Well, farmer pushed his hat back on his head, scratched his head, thought about it. Hmm. Well, that's red, but it has the doors. Well, that has doors, but hmm. I'm sorry, little fella. I don't think I can help you today. Okay, thank you. Why don't you go down the road and ask Granny? She's out on the porch this morning. I saw her out there, and maybe she can help you out. So he went skipping down the road, thinking maybe Granny could help him. And he skipped and whistled along until he came to Granny, and there she was sitting on the porch. She went up the path to the steps. Good morning, Granny. Eh? Good morning, Granny. Oh, good morning, Sonny. Can I help you today? Yes, Granny, you can, he said as loud as he could. Well, that's good. I'm happy to help. And her little face was as wizened and wrinkled as a walnut, and you knew she had years and years of wisdom in her head and in her heart. So the little boy looked at her and said, I'm trying to find a little red house with no doors, no windows, a chimney, and a star inside. Hmm. Granny pondered that over. She looked this way. She looked that way. She closed her eyes and thought deep into her memories. I don't know, little boy, but I have an idea. I think that if you follow the wind across the way to the orchard, the wind can help you out. The wind? Okay, Granny, he said. And off he went down the path and across the road and into the orchard. And the wind was blowing. And when the wind blows, you know, the leaves get ruffled. And he said to the wind, Wind, do you know where I can find a little red plop? Off of that apple tree fell a red apple. She thinks the wind might know the answer. The wind knocked this apple down. He picked it up. Well, it was little. It was red. It had no doors. It had no windows. The stem could be a chimney. But I don't know if there's a star inside. Well, stuck the apple in his pocket and made a beeline for back home. Mom, mom, mom! Oh, you're back. <laughs> mom, I think I found it. I think I found it. Found what? Mom! Oh, okay. Mom, I found it. It's a little red house with no doors, no windows, a chimney, but I don't know if there's a star inside. I know, said the mother. She took the apple, polished it up, set it on a plate, grabbed a knife, took the stem so it was laying on its side, and she cut the apple in half and opened it up and showed him the two halves of the apple. And inside, there was a star on each side. And that's the story of the little boy with the little red house. <laughs> Thank you. And the wind Thank held you. all the answers. And the wind had all the answers. <laughs> yes. And you made that delic delicious little windy noise when he came back sooner than his mother had hoped for. <laughs> right, right. That little... <gasps>
take your bath. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, if I did that as well as you did. But <laughs> I remember making that sound. <laughs> oh, here oh, you are again. Yeah. <laughs> oh, nap's over, huh? <laughs> oh, that's and it's such a great story too. I mean, and uh, and we've all been the the little boy and the little girl at one point in time. Not mm -hmm. not to be sexist, but I mean. You guys could go out and get the apples too. But I mean, it's just you've been on that little mm -hmm. kind of uh, quest, mm -hmm. and uh, mm -hmm. and you did the characters pretty yes. well too. Yes, yeah, the so farmer was, farmer was uh, just a little change in your voice, but but the the language and you know pushed his hat back. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that's what they do. Well, you know, you try to picture these things in your head, but I, I still don't think that I always give myself enough permission to do. Mm -hmm. That's why I, I still like. I feel like a, a novice storyteller. Well, you know, but you know, it's it's not so much permission. Um, in the in the art of telling the story, and and, and it worked for me. Um, you generate the vision of the little kid and the farmer and the granny, and so you're 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 actually gifting people the idea of making their own story because everybody kind of mm -hmm. travels their own route uh, with the little boy. And so I, I, think you're, I think you're right on. I think you do a pretty good job of generating those images for people. Thank you. Yeah, and Elizabeth Ellis always said, uh, hi, says, high five your story. <coughs> Excuse me. Which means add the five senses. Oh. Add the five senses. Mm -hmm. Right. And so she said that's, that's a way to get get people right there mm -hmm. so so she encourages not to rush through the plot mm -hmm. but um, adding and I just recently worked on a story with her and uh, an older woman and a young woman were sitting together outside on a porch and I went oh and I forgot the breeze and the, and the flowers and the uh, just 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 you know, a phrase, not maybe not even a whole sentence, can just sort of add color to the picture. Well, of course, sight is the yeah. we we usually overemphasize that, but sound and 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 touch we rarely touch on, um, but um, and, and, and smell and smells aroma. are very evocative. Yeah. Uh, so okay, so that's that's. But we need to we need to move along. We've been having wonderful chats. There aren't that many storytelling events in December, so. But on December second, there is the first Monday Tales and Stuff. Now at the First Reformed Church's polling chapel, with stories of the season, sweet and clear, with Mary Murphy and Barbara Palumbo. And that's going to be a good night. Um, they're they're eagerly anticipating that the storytellers. I, I think uh, it's going to be a fun night and they're good, wonderful. And there's an opportunity if you want to come and tell your own story or sing your own song. And it's one of the few places where we actually let you read a story or a poem. And uh, we, we, our last group, we had a couple of guys from the writers group there and they read some stories. So it's cool. And then uh, the following week, hmm, something's wrong with these dates. But you will see the right things on, on your screen. I will fix them before this goes to, uh, to your TV station. If December 2nd is a Monday, December 9th is not a Tuesday. So something's wrong there. But sometime in that second week of December will be uh, Interfaith Story Circle, Stories of Our Ancestors and the Land. 7 to 9 at Congregation Bereth Shalom in Troy. And the featured teller is Leah Penniman. And you can find out more at their website, withourvoice.org slash IFSC, Interfaith Story Circle. Yes. Then on Wednesday, December 18th, will be our guild meeting, Story of Story Circle of the Capital District, where people can share works in progress, not read, but they can be rough. It can be just sort of an idea that you want to brainstorm and see 
you know, I've got, I've come up with three different ways of approaching this, and can can you give me some feedback? Or to the point where you've told it's a it's a story you've told often, but not recently, and you want to tell it to some friendly faces just to get it up. So any anywhere in that spectrum of creating a story, our people are welcome at the Pine Hills branch of Albany Public Library on Western Avenue in Albany. And there is no storytelling open mic up at Cafe Lena on the fourth Tuesday, which happens to be Christmas Eve, and they suspected some that would exclude uh, <laughs> be low attendance for some people. So they will be back on January 28th. And just wanted to remind you, there are three more performances at Proctor's uh, for word plays uh, in January, February, and March. Kindness, Sticky Situations, and Lemons to Lemonade. You can always find stories on demand on, your inter on the computer. Go to storycircleofproctors.org and click on YouTube. And you can also find the, uh, these TV shows on demand. You go to storycircleofproctors.org and click on Story by Story. So we have 18 minutes left. Wow. So maybe we want to hear another story right away, and then we okay. have plenty of time to talk about it okay. without cramping yeah, your cramp your style. Uh, yes. So can you wind us? Up? No. <laughs> <laughs> um, blew you away with another yes, story. Actually. Yes. Okay, so I have three, and um, they're all still kind of like uh, not as good as I would like them to be, but um, I'm going to tell you um, the story of the first flute. The first flute. And it's interesting because when I was doing working with the musicians of Malwick, um, Norman was trying to figure out what, how he would play the flute and what flute he would play when I talk about the, uh, we're doing Thanksgiving, when we're doing the naming ceremony with, with Elizabeth. And uh, so we were looking up information about Native American flutes. So um, this story, I'll have to tell you afterwards which tribe it came from. I think it was the Lakota. But long ago, before, before even horses came to the continent, but when the Lakota people were still hunting buffalo, there was a young man who became very interested in a young woman in his tribe. But she didn't seem to be interested in meeting him. In fact, many men had expressed an interest in talking with her, being with her, and she didn't want to have anything to do with any of them. And this young man was rather shy anyway, so that made it even more difficult for him. But to take his mind off of this beautiful young woman, he decided to go hunting. After all, he could always use meat and the fur from an animal. And as he packed what he would need to be out for a, a little bit, he set off and came across the tracks of an elk. This was a hopeful sign so soon to run into the tracks of an elk. So he followed the tracks along. He followed it all over the level place and up into the hills and down into the valleys and deeper into the woods. Now occasionally he would get a quick glimpse of that elk, but never was he in a position where he could take a clear shot at it. It always seemed to disappear. And before he knew it, the day was gone and night was upon him. So. He had to spend the night out in the forest, but that wasn't unusual for him, for him to be have to do that. So he made a bed of leaves and pine needles the best he could and curled up on that cold night. And he listened to the night sounds to try to take his mind off of the cold and off of the hardness of the ground. He could hear the owls hooting in the different di distance. And of course, he knew which kind of owl was which. And he could hear the leaves rustling as the little animals came out of the night and made their way along. And he was just about to drift off to sleep when he heard a sound that was, well, 
Well, it wasn't singing, but it was beautiful, like singing. Hmm? That he'd never heard before? No, it didn't really sound like any bird, none that he'd heard. And as the night got quieter and the wind died down, he drifted off to sleep. When in the morning, when he woke up, the sun was two hands above the horizon. That was late for him to be waking up. But he realized right there in front of him was a woodpecker. And the woodpecker was tapping on the tree. Well, woodpeckers didn't usually get that close. He stood up, stretched, and put his bow on his shoulder and collected his belongings. And the woodpecker stayed. And as he started to walk away, the woodpecker flew with him. And then the woodpecker went in a different direction and he realized the woodpecker was calling to him. The woodpecker, his brother, was trying to tell him something important. He thought about getting back to the village and getting some food, but he realized he must be on some kind of a mission. And he followed the woodpecker through the woods and they really didn't have to go too far till they came to a dead tree. Now, when most of us look at trees, we say, oh, that's a lovely tree because it has beautiful spreading branches and lots of leaves that are green or in the fall maybe colored. Or maybe the tree has beautiful green long pine needles or maybe short green needles. This tree had long ago lost most of its branches and all of its leaves. But there were some branches sticking out and there were holes in the branches. Holes that probably Brother Woodpecker had packed. And then the wind came up. And he heard that sound again. This was it, the source of the beautiful song. It wasn't a bird. It wasn't people singing. It was the wind coming through this piece of wood. He climbed up the tree and managed to break off that branch with the holes in it. And he spent the day trying to make that sound again. He held it up for the wind and he ran with it and he blew on it. But nothing he could do could get that beautiful sound again. It was disappointing because that sound was so lovely. He knew that all his people would want to hear it too. Well, he stayed away from the village for four days. He didn't eat, he walked and he fasted. And on the fourth night, he laid down to sleep. And that night, the woodpecker came to him in his dreams. And in that dream, the woodpecker showed him what he needed to do to that piece of wood, to a piece of wood. He woke up in the morning completely inspired and he went and got a branch and he hollowed out the center of it and that took some patience. And the end of it had to look like the open mouth of a bird. And then he made little holes along the branch. And then he took it and he held it to his mouth and he blew. And sounds came out. And he moved his fingers over the holes and more sounds came out. And he practiced it until he decided that it was worthy for other people to hear, that maybe they would hear the beauty like he heard that night when the wind threw through the branch. It was night when he made his way back to where the teepees were. And he went to the teepee where that beautiful young girl lived. And he stood a little ways away and he began to play his flute. And it was a beautiful, sweet song. Really, a song with an invitation to come. Come. The tent flapped open, and out she came. She saw him standing there in the night with his blanket wrapped around him, playing. He knew she was there, but he didn't look. He didn't want to make her do anything she didn't want to do. She came toward him with a very soft, sweet smile on her face. She lifted the robe off of his shoulder, wrapped it around her, and stood next to him while he continued to play. 
And that's how we came to have the first flu. And that's how this young man and this young woman came to be man and wife. The end. <laughs> Thank you. So that story came from um, a series of books. I think that one was The Keepers of Life, mm -hmm. written by um, Michael Caduto and Joseph Bruchat. Mm -hmm. You may know Joe. No, yes. Joe. Yeah. I've met Michael, too. So. Yeah, that, that, that they're a great resource, and that's that's a great story. Yeah, I'm gonna hold the book up because, gosh, if any teacher is watch, watching, I think I had them here last time. The series of books is absolutely incredible, and our homes people who are homeschooling, because every story comes with a follow-up guide for science lessons, um, lessons on relationship. Mm -hmm. um, just and there's a pronouncing uh, gazetteer in the back <laughs> activities mm -hmm. it's just wonderful wonderful series of books and I used to work with one of the illustrators John Quijones Fadden he was an art teacher at Saranac Central School oh wow and he and his father John Fadden started the Six Nation Iroquois Indian Museum up in Anchayota Anchayota mm -hmm. yes yes it's not it's um, near Paul Smith. It's near between Paul Smiths and Plattsburgh, mm -hmm. off of Route Three, mm -hmm. and completely authentic. Oh, Mohawk. and Ray Fadden and um, Fran Yardley, who was born in a uh, Woody, tells the story of Ray Fadden adopting a baby porcupine. Oh yes, yes, <laughs> that's a wonderful and how, story. How, <laughs> yes, yes, a scatological tale. <laughs> and, uh, but we we digress. Right. Um, uh, but we have we have seven minutes to talk about this and and okay so that's the win. And but at celebration last year, you and Claire Nolan did a tandem tale. Were you the, the wind, wind or the sun? I was the sun. You were the sun, right? You were you were in ye yellow. <laughs> yes, and she wanted to be. She there. was the belligerent well, wind. Yes, <laughs> the blustery belligerent. Blustery belligerent wind. wind. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. Well, you know, it's it's um, it's it's a vivid story and mellow because the the quest, the the hunt, you know, you kind of describe all these things, and then he. In, in making the flute and learning to play the flute, which is, you know, and then he brings it back. And I, I just, I love the way the story kind of unfolded. That he, well, I think a lot of their stories, like there's one about the rabbit dance, and it's about you know, hunters going out and finding some rabbits, and there was a giant rabbit, and they stayed down low, and they didn't shoot the rabbits, they just waited and watched, and they watched the rabbits do this dance. And so they learned the dance and then brought that dance back to their people and that's how they got to have the rabbit dance. So, and, and just the idea that, you know, we, we have such a different outlook on trees and rabbits and everything, like rabbits are rabbits, but in that heritage, they're like their brothers. They're mm -hmm. really like mm -hmm. other people. Mm -hmm. And there's not that wall that we have. Right. Wow. Yes, I, I always remember that in conjunction with some Native American story, I learned that the people were keen watchers on what the animals did. And if the animals didn't eat the berries from a bush, you sure as heck shouldn't be doing it. I mean, animals like, some animals can't eat things that humans can't. but. Uh, if they don't eat it, there's there's a good reason, and that you should just go. Yes, you're, well, I take your wisdom. And in crossing a frozen body of water, follow the animal tracks. Yeah. I'll yeah. keep that in mind. <laughs> yes, and 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 um, somehow they know where the the springs are coming in, and they avoid those places mm -hmm. because the, the ice is unstable there. Well, I had two more stories, and one's a little bit longer than the other, and it, it's but kind of, it's so funny because it's about a, a kid who really does a, a a really terrible thing, but it's all it all ends up okay. But the other one is, is shorter, and maybe I'll just we'll like maybe two minutes now. We we have um, four. 
Four minutes? Okay. So this is how we got butterflies. And this is from the Papako tribe in the Southwest. <clears throat> so, oh, now I've forgotten what the name of the, the being was that was there. But it, it, it was just, he was out walking, and it was just after the rain. So the grass was green, the flowers were growing, the, the leaves were out on the trees, and the children were dancing and playing. And it was so beautiful, and he felt it, and he smelt it, and it, it was just one of those glorious days that just, you know, you take in with all your pores. And suddenly he was struck with a sadness because the day would be over, and this feeling might be gone. And as he walked along, some yellow leaves danced up with the wind. And he walked along, and he realized more yellow leaves were dancing up with the wind. But then when the wind died down, they were gone too. He thought, well, maybe I could create something that would remind me of this day and, and dance in the wind like those leaves did, but it wouldn't, we wouldn't need the wind. So he took his sack, and he went around and collected as many colors as he could. He collected the yellow cornmeal, or the yellow pollen and the white cornmeal. He collected green pine needles, pink rose, pink petals from flowers. Anything that had a beautiful color, he took and he put it in his bag. Oh, he took this bird song and put that in his bag too. And he went and he called all those children who were out there playing, come, come. Well, when he, this great person in their family said to come, of course they ran over and wondered what was going on. And he said, I have something for you today, something that will make you remember when the rains have come and turned the grass green and the leaves green and brought the flowers to us. I think you will like it, but I'm not sure. And you won't need the wind to make it fly. He opened the bag up, and out came orange and black butterflies, yellow and black butterflies, blue butterflies, yellow butterflies, all the butterflies with all the colors in the world that he had collected. And the children danced and jumped around as the butterflies fluttered among them. And they sang their beautiful songs. But the birds came along. They said, this is not right. You have given us the birds. And you, you gave us the song. And now you've given it to the butterflies. Well, he realized he had done the wrong thing to take the songs from the birds. He gave the songs back to the birds, but kept the beautiful butterflies that can dance in the wind or dance as if they were flying in the wind. The end. There it is. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful visual images there. Yeah. Yes. And, the, and the way the uh, the creator gathered things into his bag and they became butterflies. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, so if you're working with kids, you could think, well, what could you gather? And it can't be man-made. What could you gather to put in the bag? What would mm -hmm. you bring to put mm -hmm. it to help? Maybe he, he could have even said that to the children. Mm -hmm. Maybe if I told it again, I would have that. And one mm -hmm. would bring cornmeal and one mm -hmm. would bring yellow pollen. Mm -hmm. So it's a little more interactive. So. Yes. But we have interacted enough for today. Um, and so we have to say goodbye to you. Thank goodbye. You. Yes. Thank you for being here with us and for entertaining us and for bringing a little awe. That was yeah. really great. Well, thanks for all you do for storytelling, for storytellers, mm -hmm. and for people who crave mm -hmm. storytelling experience. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you for that. Well, we are uh, ambassadors for storytelling. And thank you for joining us. And we hope you'll come back again. And we hope to see you at one of our programs over the next couple of months. Much good cheer. It goes all my life's a circle, sunrise and sundown. The moon rolls through the nighttime till the daybreak comes around. And all my life's a circle, I can't tell you why. Seasons 